Hello, my name is Cherie Bowman and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about universal design for the web today. I would like to begin by saying that this is more of an overview than an in-depth review of all of the elements necessary to create effective universal design for the web. I will only be covering the basics with you today. There are many complex skills and processes involved in this kind of design and I will not be going into depth with those. There are many great resources out there for more in-depth information and tutorials. I will include the ones I have found at the end of this video for you. Before we begin, it's important to review what universal design is. Universal design means designing things that are usable by everyone, no matter who they are or what their needs are. If you feel like you need a better understanding of what universal design is, you can watch my Universal Design Basics video before you get started with universal design for the web. Let's get started. There are 12 elements for effective web design. These elements are images, color, contrast, video and audio, links, and headings, keyboard accessibility, tables and forms, and dynamic JavaScript, PDF documents, and text. If any of these elements sound unfamiliar to you, don't worry. You can work to be a universal designer with little experience. You will not need a lot of technical experience to understand the elements that we are about to discuss. The first element we will discuss is images. If you have an image on the page, alt or alternative text must be provided so that everyone can see the photo, including those people who cannot see it with their eyes. For instance, a blind person will not see anything if this image pops up on the screen, but if we provide alternative text, they can see with their mind what is happening on the screen. The alternative text might read, A large, never-ending field of bright yellow sunflowers with green foliage and a blue sky. Alternative text must be added in the source code of your web page. If you need help doing this, find a tutorial on adding alternative text to an image on a web page. The second element that we will discuss is color. Not all people can see color, even if it might seem like a great way to convey information. You can use the following tips to help you design with the needs of all people in mind. The first tip is to use color and symbols when designing your web page. If there's something important, don't rely on just color to tell somebody that it's there. Include a symbol for people who may not see that color the way other people do. The notification that I have included on this page features a red circle with a black exclamation point inside and text that describes what the notification means. This is a required field. The second tip is to use a limited color palette in your design. This makes it less likely that there will be color combinations that people cannot distinguish between, and you can also incorporate monochromatic elements that feature different shades of the same color to help those people with color blindness distinguish between different parts of your web page. This chart might help you understand the different types of color blindness a little better. The color bars on this page all show the same six colors, but from the perspectives of people with different types of color blindness. The color bar on top shows what a person without color blindness would see when looking from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to purple. The color bar directly below this one shows how a person with deuteranopia would see the world. People with this form of color blindness have difficulty seeing the green tones in the color spectrum. 
This is the most common form of color blindness. The color bar on the right shows how a person with protonopia would see the world. Notice that reds and greens are very faded, but blues and yellows remain the same. This form of color blindness isn't very common. The color bar on the far left shows how a person with tritonopia would see the world. This is a very rare form of color blindness. People with this type of color blindness see the world in shades of pink and blue. We must also keep in mind that there's a very small percentage of the world's population who are completely colorblind, meaning that they don't see any color at all. I am in no way an expert on color blindness. I encourage you to look at further examples by doing research and looking at other videos such as this one on YouTube about how colorblind people see the world. Tip number three tells us to use contrasting patterns rather than just contrasting colors when designing our web pages. You can see why this would be useful for colorblind people in the following example. This is an example of a pie chart that uses texture to separate its pieces rather than just color. A person who is colorblind would be able to see the differences in these patterns rather than just relying on the colors in the pie chart. Notice that each piece of the pie chart is labeled in a dark text that is large and easy to read. Ideally, this pie chart would also include the percentages that go along with each piece. It is also important to follow tip number five when designing your web page. Steer clear of the following color combinations. Avoid using these color combinations. Green and red, green and brown, blue and purple, green and blue, light green and yellow, blue and gray, green and gray, and green and black. These color combinations are known to cause issues. We are now ready to discuss the third element of universal design for the web, contrast. Appropriate contrast is important to allow people with low vision to read your text. If your website has poor contrast, some people will have a lot of trouble seeing what's on it. Keep in mind that two colors that contrast well for you may not contrast well for another person. For normal typefaces, a contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1 is appropriate. For large 14 point bold or larger typefaces, a contrast ratio of 3 to 1 is appropriate. This chart from Pittsburgh State University shows the contrast ratios of some common color combinations, such as black on white is 21 to 1, all the way down to a very light gray on white, which is a 1.61 to 1, or failing score. You can also see that the ratio of orange on white, which might seem contrasting to you, only scores a 2.94 to 1 ratio, which is a fail, and red orange on white, which is only slightly different, gets a 4.61 to 1 ratio, which is passing. Sea green on green does not score a passing ratio while sea green on darker green scores a 4.79 to 1 ratio, which is passing. Whether a ratio passes or not is based on the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. These guidelines are international and aim to provide guidelines to make the web accessible to everyone. You can go to contrastratio.com to check the contrast ratio of various color combinations. This is a screen recording of using the website so you can see what it looks like. It is very simple to use. You simply type in a color on both sides and the contrast ratio pops up in the middle. If the contrast ratio does not pass standards, it is red. 
If it does pass standards, the bubble surrounding the ratio is green. The site even tells you which level of the WCAG guidelines that this contrast ratio passes. As you watch what is happening on the screen, you may recognize some familiar color combinations or fairly popular ones that aren't actually very good to use, such as teal and gray and yellow and gray. If you spend some time working with this website, you may begin to notice that it is difficult to predict the score of various color combinations simply based on your own experience, which means that a website like this is very valuable as you design your web pages. Be sure to pay attention to how your ratio passes with regards to what font size you would be using on your web page. Let's discuss the fifth element of universal design for the web, video and audio. When creating video and audio content on the web, we must remember that not everyone can see video or hear audio. Transcripts tell word for word what is happening in your video. Transcripts should be included because the text can be converted into braille. If a video has visual activity and there is no narration, audio descriptions should be included to describe what is happening. I will include a link at the end of this video for how to include an audio description in a YouTube video. There are plenty of ways to insert audio descriptions into videos to make those videos more accessible to people who cannot see what is happening on the screen. Captions are very important in universal design. Captions allow people without hearing to read what is happening in your video. Captions describe what is happening in a video using text. Captions must use correct spelling, grammar, punctuation, etc. and match what is being said in the video word for word. While some platforms will offer automatic captioning, I think it is best to do your own captions so that you can ensure that they are 100% accurate for viewers. Lines of text in captions should be no more than 32 characters long, and each frame should hold only three or less lines of text. This ensures that viewers will have enough time to read each line of a caption. Each frame should be viewable for three to seven seconds, correspond to the audio, and be visible without covering important elements of the video. It is important to remember that nonverbal sounds like music should be placed in brackets like this, music, to let people know what is happening in your video. You could also describe things such as a dog barking loudly, upbeat music, or horse hooves clacking on concrete. If multiple people are speaking, it can be very helpful to identify who is speaking within your captions. Viewers using only captions to tell what is happening in the video may get lost if they cannot figure out who is speaking at which times. It is now time to discuss the fifth element of effective universal design for the web. Links are very useful. They can take us to a brand new web page with the click of a button. However, not all links are created equally. When you include a link, be sure that it states where it will take a person who clicks on it. It shouldn't be a mystery. Take a look at these examples. One of them simply says, click here. The other says, elephant video on YouTube. Take a second to think about it. Which one tells you where you're going to go when you click on the link? It was probably pretty obvious to you which one is more useful. If you were a person using a keyboard or screen reader to tab through the links on a page, a bunch of links that simply say, click here, are not going to be useful at all. 
If we create links that use natural language to describe where the link will take you, then those links are going to be much more useful to everybody, not just people using screen readers or keyboards to navigate the page. The sixth element of universal design for the web is headings. Effective headings organize the content on a web page and make it easy to navigate and find specific information. A person using keyboard navigation or a screen reader will benefit greatly from a well-organized web page, allowing them to navigate smoothly and in an order that makes sense. This design element is particularly useful to all users of your web page, as organization helps people understand what is happening on your web page, learn from it, and use it effectively. Headings must be designated as real headings in the source code like so. Left arrow H1, right arrow, left arrow H2, right arrow, left arrow H3, right arrow, and so on. Aim to use H1 headings only once as the main title of your page. Then, use H2 and H3 headings as subheadings to organize the page. Be sure that these headings follow the correct order. H3 headings should always be subordinate to H2 headings, always underneath of them, and never outside of them. This helps organize your information in a hierarchy. The seventh element of universal design for the web is keyboard accessibility, though I like to use the term alternative navigation. Some users will use keyboards or visual tracking to navigate web pages. For keyboard functionality, you must ensure that every element of your web page can be used with only a keyboard. To test out the keyboard functionality of a web page, click up in the address bar of the web page and then use the tab key to tab through the web page. Take note of any information that is skipped or out of order. These will provide problems for people using keyboards to navigate the web page. Tab order means the order in which a user can tab through elements on a page should make sense to someone who cannot see the rest of the page. It would make sense to tab to the title of the page, and then to the first subheading, and then to the text following that subheading, but it would not make sense for this to happen in any other order. If this is an issue, you will need to fix this in the source code of your web page. Sighted people using a keyboard need to see where they are on a page at all times. This is called a visual focus indicator. It lets people know where they are at on a page when they are using a keyboard. This is usually a glowing or dotted line around the part of the page that the person is currently on. Make sure the glowing or dotted lines in web browsers are enabled and enhance these indicators using CSS if possible. The better the visual focus indicator on your page works, the easier it will be to navigate your web page. The eighth element of universal design for the web that we will be discussing is tables. Tables may seem like a great way to display information on your web page. However, for people using devices called screen readers that read the information on the page to them, tables can be very confusing if they aren't built correctly in the code of the website. It is vitally important to match the headers in a table to the appropriate data cells so the information can be understood. Let's use this table as an example. If created correctly, a screen reader would first read the title of this table, which could be anything for our purposes. Then the screen reader will proceed to read the table like this. Gabby, Monday, 30. Tuesday, 30. Wednesday, 25. Ron, Monday, 20. Tuesday, 40. 
and so on. Now, if the source code for this table is not done correctly, it might sound more like this. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Gabby, 30, 30, 25, Ron, 20, 40, 10, and so on. With only three columns, keeping track of that data might be doable, but it's not very handy to the person listening to the data. Imagine a table with seven or more columns. It would be incredibly difficult to keep track of where you were, even if it was just days of the week as your categories. If you plan to use tables on your web page, you will need to do work to ensure that you can properly code the table so that it will work for people using screen readers. Without proper coding, a table can be absolutely useless. We can now discuss the ninth element of universal design for the web, forms. Most of us probably use forms quite a bit to fill out applications, and even shop online. We must keep in mind that when users who cannot see fill out a form, they need to hear the label for the form in order to know what information to input. You can use the label tag within the source code to help screen readers correctly read the form to users. A form that has not been labeled within the source code would be very difficult for a person using a screen reader to use and fill out. This added formatting within the source code will not affect the experience of people not using a screen reader, so there's no reason not to do it to enhance the accessibility of your web page. The tenth element of universal design for the web is dynamic JavaScript. Many websites that we see and use today are highly interactive and there are tons of changes happening on the screen every time you move the mouse. Unless we make special accommodations, these changes are not going to be accessible to people using a screen reader. For websites that include interactive and changing elements, we can use ARIA markup to make the experience accessible. Accessible Rich Internet Applications, or ARIA, markup will announce when changes on a web page are happening if inserted into HTML. If this part of your source code is done correctly, even people who cannot see with their eyes what is happening on the screen will know what is happening. This takes some hard work and dedication, but it is totally worth it to make your web page more accessible and it doesn't change the experience for other users. When coding dynamic pages, designers must take the time to ensure that keyboard focus remains intact and functional. This means that the visual focus indicators we discussed earlier still work effectively even on very dynamic web pages. Allowing people using alternative navigation to tell where they are at on your web page at all times. The eleventh element of effective universal design for the web is PDF documents. You have probably experienced plenty of PDF documents before, but did you know that most of them are not accessible to people using a screen reader? Tagged PDF files can be created so that screen readers and keyboard functionality are integrated into the document. This process is much like adding markup to HTML files, but you will need Adobe Acrobat Pro to add these tags. These tags are very worth having because they ensure that your document is organized correctly and that screen readers and keyboard users will be able to effectively navigate through your PDF document. The twelfth and final element of universal design for the web is text. There are quite a few recommendations when it comes to effective universal design and the types of text that you use. The first guideline is that you should always left justify your text to improve readability unless there is a specific reason to do otherwise. 
The second guideline is that if you need to show emphasis or denote importance, use the word important in front of the text instead of using bold or italicized words. Screen readers will not recognize bold or italicized words like a sighted user would. The third recommendation is that it is safest to stick to sans serif fonts or those fonts that don't feature serif features as this font Rockwell does. I feel comfortable using Rockwell in this video because my video features captions that are in sans serif fonts and high contrast. If my viewers want to or need to, they can turn on these captions and use them as an alternative to the text on each slide. Sans serif fonts look like this. They do not have the feet of serif fonts. There is a font developed specifically for people with dyslexia that features weighted parts of each letter. If you are interested, you can look into purchasing a license to use dyslexia fonts yourself. The fourth recommendation for using text when designing on the web is that electronic documents should feature a font size of at least 12 point. Larger fonts are more accessible to more people. This recommendation comes from Wichita State University. When presenting to a room of people, font size should be one inch tall for every 10 feet of room length always at least two inches tall. This means that if you are presenting in a room that is 50 feet long, your text needs to be five inches tall on your presentation. The sixth recommendation is that you should use single spaces after periods, tools for indentation, and only return once between paragraphs to accommodate screen readers. Screen readers tend to have difficulty with extra spaces in text. When using indentation or spacing out your text, be sure to use indentation tools instead of just using multiple spaces to indent. The seventh recommendation is to create bulleted and numbered lists using the built-in functions in word processing applications to avoid confusion. If you create lists manually using asterisks or symbols, screen readers will not read your text correctly. They can, however, recognize those lists created with the built-in functions in programs like Microsoft Word. The eighth recommendation goes back to something we have already discussed. You must remember to use color and contrast in ways that support colorblind users and users with low vision. Be mindful of this when choosing your text colors. The ninth recommendation goes back to web links. Create web links that show where the user is headed. If the document will be printed, preface the link with web link. If you must include a full web link in your document, be sure to get a shortened version of that link. Shorter links are better, as screen readers will read every character within the link. The tenth recommendation goes back to effective headers. You should generally include one H1 heading per document, using H2 and H3 headings to organize other areas of the document. When choosing line spacing for your text, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 recommends line spacing of at least 1.5 times the font size and paragraph spacing of at least 2 times the font size. Each line of text should be 40 to 60 characters long in a paragraph. Lines that are too long or too short can hinder readability. You have now made it through all 12 elements for effective web design in Universal Design. Remember that Universal Design makes experiences and products that are usable by everyone. Many elements of Universal Design are useful in multiple ways, not just for one or two groups of people. 
the user experience is often improved across the board for everyone. In review, we have covered images, color, contrast, video and audio, links and headings, keyboard accessibility or alternative navigation, tables and forms, and dynamic JavaScript, PDF documents, and text. I challenge you to take what you have learned in this video and expand upon your understanding. Take a look at some of your favorite websites and test out their accessibility. Try creating your own website or blog using these elements within your designs. And spread the word about universal design so that we can make the world a more accessible place to every single person. I would like to thank Dr. Gibson at Emporia State University. All of the content within this video is used with his permission from his lecture. I would also like to thank Pittsburgh State University, Nobility.org, Wichita State University, TutsPlus.com, and ContrastRatio.com for the fantastic resources that have allowed me to learn more about web content accessibility. And of course, thank you to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines for guiding us to a better future. Thank you for learning with me today.